let me introduce our speakers for this evening. Our principal speaker is Randall M. Miller, PhD. He's the William Dirk Warren Class of 50 Sesquicentennial Chair and Professor of History at St. Joseph's University. He's the author or editor of numerous books that include Religion and the American Civil War, The Birth of the Grand Old Party, the Republicans' First Generation, and Dear Master, Letters of a Slave Family. Dr. Miller has been a consultant for and has appeared in documentaries on American culture and history, the Civil War, politics, religion, African-American culture and life, slavery, Philadelphia life and politics, and many other topics, which have aired on national cable and public broadcast channels and regional and local television, and are often used in schools across the country. Welcome, Randall. Thank you. Patrick Clark is the director of President James Buchanan's Wheatland here at Lancaster History. He guides the preservation and the historic interpretation of the Wheatland Historic Site and is also Lancaster History's Director of Visitor Services. Mr. Clark served as the Executive Director for three other industrial and political historic sites. The most recent was President Woodrow Wilson's birthplace in Stanton, Virginia, where he guided the vision to reinvent the site as a presidential library with digitized collections and programming. It's my pleasure to turn this over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Tom. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so happy that you could be with us this evening. Uh, we're going to be uh, having a, a hopefully a, a pretty brisk and uh, uh, good discussion about the presidential election of 1852 with Randall Miller. Uh, Randall, let's get right into it. And uh, we'll start off uh, with a question that has to do with President Fillmore. Um, as you know, and maybe most of our uh, our guests tonight know, that the 1852 presidential election uh, occurred two years after President Fillmore signed the Compromise of 1850 into law. Can you take a few moments and expand on the role of the 1850 Compromise and its effect on the 1852 election? Sure. And, uh, first of all, thank you all for having me here in the first of the series here on the presidential uh, elections, 1852, 56, uh, 60. Um, and this one, of course, is entitled The Election of 1852, The Road to Disunion. And I hope to make some suggestions about why that title is so apt. Um, I will say off the top before responding to your question that the 1852 election is one of the least studied. Uh, but I will try to suggest that in some ways it might be one of the most important, certainly in terms of suggesting the direction that politics, politics were going to go in the 1850s, uh, even though that was unanticipated and unwanted by the principles that were involved in the presidential campaign in 1852. Um, your question is right on target, Pat, in terms of the relationship between the Compromise of 1850 and the election of 1852. In fact, in, in many ways, the election of 1852 was really the extension of what the Compromise of 1850 was supposed to achieve, um, partly what it did achieve, uh, and also what it failed to achieve, uh, which almost will sum up the 1852 election. Basically, the Compromise of 1850, and I'll describe it in a minute, was an attempt by the regular party people, uh, Democrats and Whigs, principally Democrats putting it together, but uh, not only, uh, to try to return politics to a level of normality. Um, during the 1830s, but especially the 1840s, the glue that was holding together the second American party system was coming apart. And the principal reason it was coming apart is that the tacit agreement that the two major parties had uh, basically uh, worked out and honored uh, through the 1830s and 1840s was to, to talk about anything you wanted. You talk about banks, talk about internal improvements, talk about infrastructure, which is the same thing as internal improvements, harbor bills. Uh, it definitely talk about and do something about expanding West. But with the one thing you don't bring up in public debate, don't bring into the public square because it's so divisive. It's non-negotiable. It'll shatter the parties, it'll shatter the union with slavery. And they by and large kept it out. Uh, but they couldn't keep it out altogether because 
party regulars did not manage all of politics. As we'll see, there are people uh, who were outside of the normal political stream, abolitionists, for example, some of whom didn't respect the political parties at all, uh, fire-eating Southerners, who also, if they couldn't manage the parties, were willing to sacrifice them in the interests of Southern slavery's interests. Um, and these two elements kept pressing to bring slavery into public discussion. Uh, one, to try to find ways to end it, and the other, of course, to try to find ways to extend it. And all of this came to a head because of, uh, of expansion. One thing that Republicans, excuse me, that uh, Whigs and Democrats could agree upon is that America had to expand, it had to grow, but where and how was an issue. That'd be one of the things that would become James Buchanan's principal concerns when he was uh, Secretary of State and then when he was uh, um, uh, ambassador, we didn't, he wasn't a minister, we didn't have ambassadors then, minister to England. Um, right. And that became the issue in terms of the Mexican War. And we don't want to get into all the details of the Mexican War, but it does lead up to the Compromise of 1850. But we waged a war with Mexico. It was a war of expansion. And we did remarkably well during the war. And one of the things that then happened as the war progressed is what are we going to do with the prospect of acquiring huge chunks of land from Mexico? And within the Democratic Party, there were concerns by some Democrats, by, known as barn burnies among other, William, uh, David Wilmot being one from Western Pennsylvania, that the Democratic Party was falling too much under the power, the yoke of Southern Democrats who were pressing a kind of expansion for slavery's interest, but not for free soil interest. And so he proposed that any land that would be acquired from Mexico during and because of the war would be closed to slavery, the so-called Wilmot Proviso, which passed the House and failed in the Senate. The importance of the Wilmot Proviso is that it forced into public discussion. It brought up into Congress that one issue that the party regulars said we must never bring up because once it gets in, we can never get it out. We cannot control it. It's an economic issue, it's an ideological issue, it's certainly a sectional issue, it's even a moral issue in many ways. But now it was in, and once in, you couldn't get it out. So uh, continuing now up to 1850, by 1850, there are a whole host of questions related to settling the West. Uh, will it be open for slavery? It won't be open for slavery. What are you going to do about California? Gold is discovered there. They have enough people filling up that uh, they could qualify as a state. All kinds of things. And party regulars, Whigs and Democrats, then in Congress, and this would be a congressional solution, decided they would try to put everything on the table, have a so-called omnibus bill, and write everything into law to solve all these outstanding problems, these volatile, uncontrolled problems, and that would be the Compromise of 1850. Uh, it was a very strange compromise, because as we'll see, uh, both sides, Southerners and Northerners, never agreed on all the parts. They agreed each on particular parts. But it's important to know what the parts were, because this is where the 1852 election is actually going to fail to achieve its principal purpose, which was to say that the compromise was the final solution. And the final solution was, we solved all the problems with slavery. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> it, had, it had several components to it. Uh, and it went through all kinds of gyrations and configurations and whatever, but for our purposes, this is the basic thing. It provided that California would be admitted as a free state. And this was clearly an advantage to the free states, the free soil interests, because it would end the phenomenon of parallelism of always balancing free state, one free state with one slave state, and that was one of the things that parties managed to make sure slavery was never an issue. It provided for uh, the, oh, the development of two territories, the Mexico Territory, Utah Territory, with the provision uh, that uh, they could be uh, subject to popular sovereignty when they're organized as territories. And popular sovereignty was a very popular idea. Again, how can we take the issue of slavery in the territories away from us? Well, we'll give it to the people in the territories, very democratic, et cetera. It hadn't been tried yet. A Lewis Cass in 1848 suggested that this was the way to deal with the problem of slavery. So now that, that, that's an option. It also provided for settling some boundary disputes uh, between Texas and New Mexico territory. It provided as well that slave, the slave trade would be prohibited in the capital of the United States. Uh, even many Southerners were embarrassed by actually the trafficking humans, not slavery ending, but the slave trade. So 
in many respects, this looks like a victory for northern interest, free soil interest, barn burners, or what have you, in terms of, you know, a, a free state's going to come in, they're going to be living on the slave trade, etc. So southerners wanted and they got one thing. What they got it was an invigorated federal Fugitive Slave Act, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which would be the most dramatic expansion of federal authority uh, up to that time. And basically, the Fugitive Slave Act provided, and the details are slightly important. I want to belabor this because if everything comes out in 1850, by 1852, it provided for the creation of a federal officers, in a, set, a sense, the so-called uh, uh, commissioners, who would be charged then with uh, both uh, um, apprehending and then adjudicating uh, cases of fugitive slaves who could be captured by simply a slaveholder taking out a form, filling out a form saying so and so uh, was an escaped fugitive and bringing them before the law. Uh, these special commissioners, in effect, uh, had the power not only to go after the slaves, but then they would sit as the courts themselves. And uh, they, these were non-jury courts, and the courts would not allow for the testimony even of the enslaved, the so-called fugitive slave, the supposedly enslaved person. They would not allow that person to call witnesses. Uh, they would not allow them to do anything. Uh, it would be possible for a white person to plead that person's case, but no black person was ever going to appear in that court, even the person who had been taken up as a slave. Uh, th this was basically Southern law. Uh, non-jury trial uh, where an, a slave had done something, whether running away or whatever. And in fact, it was essentially recognizing the slave not as a person, but as property, which is what Southerners wanted in people thinking about slaves, not persons, their properties. And that's what's the emphasis here. The final thing for our purposes, because this is what's going to transform the politics in the North uh, and, and lead to the failure of the 1850 compromise solving the problems and going to lead to the disruptions that come from 1852 on was the provision that these uh, federal slave commissioners had the power to uh, call on any and all citizens to help in the apprehension of alleged fugitives. And if you obstructed this in any way, you could be arrested yourself, fined, I believe it was uh, up to $1,000, and also be put in prison for six months. So basically, what Southerners said is we're going to give you all this other stuff. The one thing we want is this Fugitive Slave Act, this powerful federal law that can override states, because many northern states, because there already was a fugitive slave law, were having personal liberty laws or what have you. They're providing basic rights in terms of uh, trial by jury, uh, habeas corpus and what have you, uh, that were disrupting efforts of fugitive slave catchers just to go up and grab people in Pennsylvania or wherever. Okay, so that, that, that's the background. Uh, and then this became the final solution. Whigs and Democrats agreed that this was going to be the final solution. We've solved everything, and we're not going to talk about it anymore. But immediately, you could see that there were problems to it. And this is, again, foreboding why 1852 is the election is really not going to work for what it was supposed to do. And that's to confirm that this, in fact, is the new political order. And that was as early as... Um, uh, uh, December of 1850, uh, Southerners, some Southerners, fire eaters, what have, fire eaters, what have you, began to say it's not the final solution because what we really want out of this thing is a test. They want a test of the loyalty of Northerners. Would they willingly participate in the capture of such fugitives? Would they prevent any kind of obstruction? Uh, and if they did, Maybe we can trust them some more because there was deep distrust of many Northerners. Why? Because abolitionists supposedly were running rife. Why? Because you got barn burners and what have you saying that we should uh, close the West off to slavery. And so, uh, and they made it very clear that if this didn't happen, they would consider secession. The so-called Georgia platform was an actually visible expression of that and basically said that if you fail to do this, if you betray this trust, then basically we have to start thinking about leaving a union because you cannot be trusted in it. All right, so that, that's important context. On the other side, of course, you had many people who didn't want to accept it because of the Fugitive Slave Act. You had many Northerners, not all, but you had many Northerners who didn't like the idea of now that they're gonna to have to be complicit 
in the taking up of fugitives. And I want to spend about two minutes on this because this actually is, is of enormous importance in terms of the politics of the 1850s. And maybe put up on the screen then uh, a couple of the images that we have. Because sure. one of the things that happened from the beginning, it was happening already, was the refusal of many Northerners to participate willingly in the taking up of fugitives. You could put up the effects of the fugitive slave law, the first image. Sure. Uh, let's see. Time wise, I talked too much. Okay, oh, we got a little time. There we go. Okay. And I'll just show, I'm just going to show a couple images here to give a sense of this because uh, what happened almost from the out uh, immediately is there were many incidents and they were depicted in, uh, in lithographs and, and all kinds of drawings and literature, as we'll see in a minute. Of, uh, of instances of uh, enslaved people running away, uh, efforts to capture them, shooting them in the process. Uh, well, what happened almost immediately in the North was a, an outcry because Northerners were being asked to do the slaveholders bidding. And you had all kinds of examples of it. You even had violent examples of it, close to Lancaster. And uh, James Buchanan himself uh, commented on this, the Christiana riot, where a slaveholder in, uh, uh, from Maryland came up to try to recover one of his slaves. Uh, there was a violent resistance to this. Uh, the slaveholder was killed. Uh, eventually, others would be, people would be brought to trial. But the point was, is there was violent resistance to efforts of slave catchers, slaveholders, to be able to do what they wanted on northern territory. And it literally was in an echo distance, one could say, of Wheatland, if you will. So there was no escaping this new reality. And the new reality was that northerners were not going to comply with this law willingly that there will be enough of them who would resist it. And I want to provide a little context here. So this is just an image of that. There's another image as well. Uh, if you could go to the next one, which is Anthony Burns. Uh, and this is an image from 1854, because through the early 1850s, then there'll be a whole series of, uh, of cases whereby a, a fugitive, alleged fugitive will be taken up, he'll be put in jail, et cetera. And then there'll be efforts by various people to spring him from jail. Uh, and this was the most celebrated case in 1854. And I'm just causing this one. It's got some things in the background. And so you can look at it, if you will, uh, the history of uh, Anthony Burns. And the interesting thing there was a fugitive from Virginia. Uh, he went to Boston. Uh, he was discovered. He was arrested there. He was jailed. Uh, there were efforts then to break him free from jail. It took actually the militia and then it took armed soldiers in order to, re, uh, to in effect, bring him back into slavery. The important thing here was is is that many people, black but also white, then by 1854 will have come to believe that if they're going to be honorable men, if they're going to resist demands of Southerners to have them do their bidding, they can't just write about it. They can't just wring their hands about it. They must act on it. That, that, that require men must face other men, uh, mano a mano. And, uh, uh, Couple instances here, just for, again, context. I give you a lot of context, but the election is really about the context where the, uh, that's going to cause certain kinds of conduct. Uh, yeah. The idea of a, the, the Fugitive Slave Act, and there's another image you can put on the practical illustration of the Fugitive uh, Slave Law, uh, just another image as well uh, in terms of violence and uh, the, the slaveholders, if you look, you know, riding a politician, et cetera, uh, slaveholders in effect making demands. In this case, it's William Garrison protecting an African-American woman with a gun, not likely the Garrison would do that, but perhaps even abolitionists who are non-resistant would take up arms and use violence. Uh, one of the images that really comes out of this is the idea of a slave power conspiracy. And this derived from a whole series of actions that Southerners had demanded of Congress and of people in the North in order to protect slavery's interests. For example, uh, the Southerners demanded a gag rule in the 1830s. And that was there were petition campaigns on the part of abolitionists to get people to sign up, uh, say, you know, to get their Congress people to introduce legislation and slavery in the District of Columbia, for example, which is something Congress could do. Congress couldn't do anything about slavery where it already existed in law, but it could do things like in the territories, it could do things in the high seas, it could do things in the District of Columbia, all kinds of petitions, tens of thousands of people signing them. And what Southerners demanded is that when these petitions came to Congress, they not even be read. They not only would, were not going to be, uh, not even enter into the public record as if they never happened. 
And in effect, that was demonstrating a power of slavery to stand between you and your representative and dictate what your representative would, would read, what your representative would do. Examples as well in terms of the interdiction of the males. One of the things the abolitionists were doing is that they were blanketing the South in all kinds of anti-slavery literature to try to persuade Southerners of the wrong of slavery, et cetera. Uh, but white Southerners, not surprising, feared this. They thought that it would be it was incendiary, could lead to slave rebellions. There were instances of, of the Northern information creeping down into the South, supposedly, and inciting rebellion in Charleston, uh, 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 Nat Turner. I mean, all these kinds of things, real fears, the Haiti, the fear of a real slavery building, haunting the Southerners, all this sort of thing. So uh, Southern postmasters asked for, and the uh, Jackson administration, uh, they got compliance that they could intercede. They could, in effect, examine the mails and determine which mail was to be circulated. And there again, here's a power of the slave power. They could stand between you, writing somebody, your aunt down in Charleston, what have you, and who would decide whether your aunt down in Charleston is actually going to get the letter Why the grubby pod I can see the image here, uh, 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 postmaster ripping it open. Another example of Southern power. Right. Uh, examples as well of attacks upon anti-slavery speakers, uh, the, the, the attacks upon anti-slavery press. All these kinds of things were things that anti-slavery people were saying, you, should, uh, you might not care about blacks, you might not care about slaves, but you should care about your basic civil liberties. That's the slave power threatens them. Now you have this Fugitive Slave Act making the ultimate claim on you a claim that you actually couldn't run away from. And that was it could literally reach into your home and in some cases did reach into your home demanding that you go out in that wood. The slave commissioners come by, hey, Jake, uh, the nice little farmer, uh, there's a slave, he's, he's run away from Maryland, he's hiding in the woods, he's got a gun, he's, not, he's dangerous. I want you, I'm deputizing you to go in that wood and drag him out for me. Right. And you don't want to leave your little home. You don't want to leave your cherubic little children, you know, eating there. You don't want to leave the, the grace that you're saying to take because there's a knock on the door and he can come and do that. But the power of slavery that became evident is they could do this to you. And if you didn't do that, you would go to jail. You could lose your property. Right. And they grafted onto this sort of thing then. Where, of course, the, was the moral question that came in 1852 was there already with Uncle Tom's Cabin, Uncle Tom's Cabin that made African Americans, it humanized them for many people. But the big thing in the Uncle, Uncle Tom's Cabin, this enormous bestseller, was, of course, that it raised the fundamental moral question of what will you do if the slave comes to your door? Uh, it's like we've seen today, what will we do if somebody comes to our door in need? And of course, it's the Christian thing. We know what we're supposed to do from Matthew. Right. And so that was extremely important in terms of Northern thinking, this growing sense that Southerners are compelling us to do things that we don't want to do. And but not all, but not all Northerners, right? No, no, yeah, not all no. <laughs> still hated the abolitionists. Uh, in yeah. fact, some of them were blaming abolitionists for this. James Buchanan was blaming abolitionists for all exactly. the abolition. Franklin Pierce in 1852, the presidential candidate, is blaming abolitionists for all the agitation. But the point is, contextually, many Northerners who might not have cared about the South, who cared about slavery, are being drawn into it. So that which was to take the slavery question off the table, ironically, has thrust it into the public where it can't go away. And it made it different. It wasn't just, I care about the slave. It's now, I care about my own self-interest. Okay. Right. So in the midst of all this, there is going to be an election. And there right. was an election in 1852. Well, let, let's, let's uh, uh, shift gears. We can talk about the election. Yeah, well, let, let's uh, shift one gear here a little bit. And, uh, and it, it has to do with the uh, 1852 election, of course. Yeah. Um, but, uh, um, in the 19th century, uh, many of uh, those who made it to the presidency uh, had once served in the cabinet position of Secretary of State. Uh, that was typically the stepping stone to the U.S. presidency. However, in 48, the democracy passed over Secretary of State James Buchanan uh, for Michigan's U.S. Senator Lewis Cass. And in 1852, Buchanan came back under consideration. Uh, and again, we see the Democrats uh, uh, passing him over. He is seen as a preferable candidate, but uh, how did all this uh, 1852 convention have an effect on Buchanan his, with his pu future political ambitions? 
Okay, well, that's a great question. Maybe we could back up a little bit on that and bring it forward if you want to just show a couple of these images here. Because sure, Based sure. something about the, the circumstance in 1852. And the circumstance in 1852, and this was a large circumstance of the 1850s, and this is where we can plug Buchanan in, is that there was uh, a major shift going on in American politics. Uh, that one, one shift, of course, as I already suggested, is we're not going to kick the slavery issue out. Uh, it's going to fracture the political parties and actually give the rise to a new sectional party that will become uh, the, the second party in a new party system. That will be the Republican Party. There were other things as well, and there will be constant political agitation. The idea of the compromise was an 1852 election, suppose he was going to be the real, realization, is things are going to go back to normal, kind of a quiet, so we can talk about, you know, banks and these kinds of things. But instead, there'll be constant agitation over the slavery issue that's going to intrude everywhere. And that's going to affect people's tempers and their temperament. But you also had a change going on here generationally in political leadership. The great men were passing from the stage. Uh, by 1853, the, you know, uh, Clay will be dead. Webster will be dead by the end of 1853. Calhoun's already gone. The kind of people who could command national respect. You didn't always agree with them. But people across sections might be willing to follow them. And a whole new generation of, of, of uh, so-called leaders was emerging, led by Stephen A. Douglas, who was the principal architect of the Compromise of 1850, which was no compromise at all in the sense that uh, he just stitched together little coalitions to get each piece, uh, each piece passed. Uh, but a whole new generation, some of the so-called young Democrats, uh, who were in effect saying that uh, a bunch of old fogies, which included Buchanan, uh, <laughs> have basically run the party, uh, they did what they had to do, uh, but it's time for a new, young, energetic group of people who are going to be more aggressive on expansion uh, than previously. Everybody was from Manifest Destiny, but how fast are you willing to do it? How aggressively are you willing to do it? And so these young Democrats were pressing for that and a whole host of other things as well. And they're looking at people like Buchanan, Lewis Cass, and what have you, as past tense. And that's what, how they're going to be perceived in 1852. This image, the first image you have, says something else. There really was no front runner uh, in the Democratic uh, Party. Um, you, didn't, you had uh, people who had state followings or what have you. But you, as I said, you didn't really have national leaders. And this, this is right before the, the conventions, and it's speculating on who it might be. Uh, both for Whigs and for Democrats. And the speculation, well, it could be Stephen A. Douglas, who was a man of some prominence, or uh, for the Whigs, it could be Daniel Webster and his last legs, or what have you. There's Lewis, uh, you know, it could be Lewis Cass, or it could be Winfield Scott. Go to the next one. Soliciting a vote here. And that was because nobody had any idea who would likely get the nod because there was no Andrew Jackson about anymore. It's useful to remember as well, I think, in terms of the politics, and it says something unsettling was, um, that uh, absent a strong figure, a truly national figure, uh, you had in the Democratic Party in their uh, nominating conventions uh, numerous ballots going on and on in order to find somebody, the 35th ballot, the 39th ballot. I mean, that was true in 1844. It was true in 1848 to some extent, and it'd be true again in 1852. And that, that's an indication here of, you know, of, of a lack of a consolidated leader who could command respect and get it. Now, this is one of my favorite images here because it sums up what I'm just trying to say. And this is the local focal candidates traveling on the canal system on, uh, on the Salt River. The Salt River was an image of people who were going to their political death, what have you. Nothing can live in a Salt River. And on the boat here, you can see uh, Sam Houston uh, in front, what have you, saying things were, you know, in Texas. You've got Buchanan here looking through the telescope. Basically, he said, I've been this, I, haven't I been down here before? Uh, <laughs> Douglas looks like he's picking the pocket. He's the one of the young, uh, the uh, young Democrats. Uh, and, and Lewis Cass, uh, who's just way too fat now, lying down in the back, uh, saying, you know, wake me up, uh, old buck, if uh, anything is going on. This was an indication here of how many of that previous generation were regarded by the younger generation, if you will. We don't really need these people. Their time has passed. Uh, what we need is somebody who will be attractive in 1852. Uh, and what was attractive in 1852, the winning combination, whether it was Whig or Democrat, was somebody who had a military background. 
uh, which is something Buchanan didn't have. If you look at the candidates, uh, people, the Whig Party, well, well, we know how to win elections because we won in 1840 with uh, Tippecanoe and Tyler II. Uh, and then we won in 1848 with uh, Rough and Ready Zach Taylor, et cetera, uh, the, you know, one of the great heroes of, uh, of the Mexican War. So we're going to go for Then They eventually went for a general again themselves, Winfield Scott. The Democrats realized they needed to do the same thing. And in the background, people were working for their various favorites, et cetera. Franklin Pierce had a couple things going for him, not because he had been politically active. He'd been back up there in New Hampshire, working on his law, his, uh, uh, his law career, et cetera. He didn't want to go back to Washington. His wife definitely didn't want him to go back to Washington, but he had advocates. Some were generals, military people who wanted somebody like that uh, favoring military interests. And then of course, New, ha uh, uh, New Hampshire Democrats. Buchanan didn't have that. He, he wasn't a national hero. Uh, he was in many ways, he was already the old public functionary. Right. Factotum, if you will. And, and didn't even have the drama, but, you know, he was a secretary of state. He did good things, but it's not like secretaries of state today who are going to wing all over the place and they're constantly in the news. Secretaries of state basically were office keepers in many respects. They were, they were managing, uh, moving paper along. And so uh, he wasn't able to generate news, and he certainly wasn't able to generate a sense of, of great strength. And it didn't help that public perceptions of uh, the old public functionary as well was that he was kind of a bit of a bit of a sissy. He was not masculine in that sense that people wanted to have in the 19th century. Right. One thing about veterans, one thing about generals, they were masculine. They had demonstrated their courage and Buchanan hadn't demonstrated anything like that at all. So in one sense, he was behind, he was behind the times. He was also in trouble. And what's interesting, if you look who finally gets the nod, if we could switch to the next ones, just go through the images. Now, Franklin Pierce is going to get the nod because he was, quote, re rendered as General Franklin Pierce. And he had served uh, in the Mexican War. Uh, he had a strong state uh, organization behind him. And again, he had the two qualities that uh, were needed in order to get the nomination of the Democratic Party. And that was he was accessible. Um, and he was available, uh, excuse me, he was acceptable and he was available. He was acceptable to, to Southerners. They had, uh, Democrats had a, a rule that you had to have two thirds of delegates in order to get the nomination. So it gave Southerners a veto power. They might not be able to get their person, but they could veto anybody else. They also knew they needed to have some kind of a Northerner on the ticket, uh, but so that would be acceptable to them in terms of slavery. And Franklin Pierce, like James Buchanan, was acceptable on slavery. Uh, if they weren't ardently pro-slavery, they certainly were willing to support slavery, which by 1852 was enough. In 1856, it's not enough. They're going to demand more. Uh, so Franklin Pierce is going to get the nod over James Buchanan because he had attributes that Buchanan um, doesn't have. One final one, by the way, to answer your question, uh, was also that Buchanan did not control the Pennsylvania delegation. Uh, there wasn't unanimity behind him in 1852. There were rivals. Uh, you know, there's still George Dallas group, and there was also the um, Simon Cameron, uh, and there were many Democrats who didn't trust Buchanan because he was seen as being in the pocket of Southerners. And so barn burners, et cetera, weren't going to accept them free soil types. Uh, whereas uh, uh, Pierce was less well known. If you go through, it's interesting that in the images of Franklin, an image presentation, people were very conscious of creating images. Uh, he's a statesman as here, but he was almost invariably referred to as General Franklin Pierce because that was really the calling card more than anything else. And then you can go to the one that has the Grand National Democratic Banner, uh, the next one up. And there we have it, the typical thing. And of course, uh, the, Buchanan got something out of 1852. He was able to push his longtime friend, uh, w William King, uh, as vice president, who's there. So it was Pierce and King, uh, King from Alabama. Uh, they had been longtime uh, messmates and roommates, uh, so to speak. And uh, there were also been whispers for a long time about perhaps something more intimate between uh, King and Buchanan. But whatever, the, the, the symbols here that you'd expect to see and the symbols suggesting here, this is all for you. Then the party ran on, we don't have time to go through all this, but just a quick look at these other images here. And in 18, and this is image of uh, basically the taking over Tammany. And then the next image I wanna emphasize briefly, if you look at this, and that was uh, the, the issue in 1852 was very simple, that the compromise of 1850 is the final solution. 
and we're not going to discuss it at all because everything is settled. In fact, it wasn't. Everything is settled. So we're going to say, we're going to move on. And so personal issues came to the fore. And one, of course, was a question whether Franklin Pierce has conquered his, alcohol, his alcoholism. And this was a reference to that. There were many frequent references to that. So, uh, but at least they weren't talking about slavery. Um, and then if you go to the next one, some people were talking about slavery. And basically, this was the position of the Democratic Party, and that is by accepting the Compromise of 1850, and th meant you were accepting what, uh, uh, what happened after that was a, an aggressive South demanding that Northerners bend the knee to slavery. In this case, it's Franklin Pierce down there. That's the Mason-Dixon line going across, kissing at a slaveholder standing over him. He'll whip him like he'll whip any Northerner if you don't do his bidding, and the devil, of course, cheering things on. And that creates this kind of image as well. An image that's not going to work to the advantage of the Democratic Party by saying slavery is settled, because it's a reminder that slavery is very much unsettled. And then we have a lot of images, we don't have time for all of them, uh, looking at the other side, because the other part of the story is what happens to the Whigs. And they put up uh, Winfield Scott. Why? Not because he was a political genius, not because people even knew where he stood, but because he was available. He was available, and he was another one of the heroes of the War of, uh, he was a hero of the Mexican War, a hero of the War of 1812, uh, yeah. fuss and feathers, if you will. And then, so he gets the nod because he's a general. Um, and this is an image here showing uh, the race. You've got uh, on the left, if you're looking at it, uh, you've got Winfield Scott, who looks pretty, very trim in that. Daniel Webster, who didn't get the nod from the Whigs and ran as an independent briefly, and then somewhere in the background, General Franklin Pierce. But then you get, of course, it's really a two person race, two party race. If you go to the next image, the Gamecock and the Goose, which also renders a very fit. Uh, Winfield Scott, which he wasn't, and uh, suggesting he's way ahead. And this was raising some questions about Franklin Pierce's service during the war. There are rumors he had served valiantly in the Mexican War, but he was wounded. He had left this tent, I think it was Chiribusco, uh, and fainted. And some people said, well, basically that shows that he was a coward or he was drunk or whatever. So you have that. But the big one here that sums it up is the managing a candidate. And I show this one because uh, the problem, that, there are a lot of problems that Scott and the, and the Whigs had, but the biggest problem they had is the Whigs were coming apart over the slavery question. They were so-called conscience Whigs who themselves didn't want to accept the Compromise of 1850 because of the Fugitive Slave Act in it. And there were so-called cotton Whigs who wanted to accept it because they were concerned about uh, the economic relations with the South, et cetera. And the belief was is that Winfield Scott was actually more tilting more toward the conscience Whigs than the cotton Whigs. This is an image here of uh, William Henry Seward, who was a champion of Scott, uh, holding his mouth, stepping over the plank that is the agreement supposedly the Whigs had made, the Democrats had made, the final solution is the Compromise of 1850. We'll talk about something else. Uh, and this is an image that Seward was actually managing uh, the candidate. And so, of course, as the next image show, there's the great crack up. Uh, the Democrats win overwhelmingly. There are all kinds of reasons for this. For our purposes here, Franklin Pierce then is going to be elected overwhelmingly. The Democrats are going to get control of the Congress. The Whig Party is going to completely come apart. So you're going to have a period of one party rule that's going to give rise to all kinds of people on the left extreme and on the right extreme, ardent pro-Southerners, pro-slavery advocates, uh, ardent uh, free soilers, et cetera. And with no mediating influence of two parties operating under the old two-party system of saying we can manage affairs. Uh, so what you have finally as well with the crack up here is also one could say a kind of arrogance that's going to characterize the Democratic Party now in power. Buchanan gets a break. Uh, Buchanan is basically sent packing uh, by Pierce, by sends him over to, um, to England to serve as minister uh, to, in, in, in Great Britain, uh, and actually works out very well for uh, for Buchanan. Uh, he enjoys his time over there. Uh, Harriet's over there with him. Uh, they become something of I, may, maybe darlings is too strong a word, but uh, Queen <laughs> rather likes them. Uh, he gets himself involved with the Austin Manifesto. I know we have a slide on that, which was part of an aggressive effort on the part of uh, the Pierce administration to uh, force Spain to sell Cuba 
uh, completely botched job. Uh, but he does get some brief fame by uh, an incident there where uh, Buchanan refused to dress up the way aristocrats do at the court and in effect, you know, play the European game. He's going to be an American. He's going to dress as an American. He's not going to, in effect, kowtow to the British. And so for one brief moment in that thing, the Americans are applauding James Buchanan, not because of some diplomatic triumph, not for some military triumph, but right. for a, 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 a triumph of, uh, of dress and etiquette, if you will. But he's lucky he's over there because now the party system is completely coming undone because Democrats overreach. They overreach by pushing through the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. And we don't really have time to discuss that, but the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 basically ended the agreement that had gone back to 1820 in terms of where slavery could go in the West. And it felt like a huge betrayal to many, many Northerners who were already now keyed up to being concerned about an aggressive pro-slavery South, making demands on them in every way, interfering in their affairs, uh, endangering their civil liberties. And the one thing most Northerners wanted was free soil, that is free access to the West without having to compete with slavery. And the Kansas-Nebraska Act, by offering popular sovereignty, so the Kansas Territory basically was saying, this is now open to slavery. And that destroyed, the Whig Party was done in 1852, but this threatened to destroy the Democratic Party, which started to come apart. And out of this is going to come the Republican Party, a truly sectional party that brought together old Whigs, barn burner and other Democrats, free soilers, liberty men, nativists, uh, people who are not nativists, all looking for a new political home in the midst of all this. And they were committed to one thing, and that was no further extension of slavery in the territories. And that would redo American politics. And when James Buchanan comes back for 1856, he's going to be greeted by all that. He's going to be greeted by young Democrats still wanting to control the party, He's going to be greeted by nativists and what have you, drumming up things that the immigrants are coming in, the Catholic Church taking over. He's going to come in to fears about an overly aggressive uh, South that will use any means, what force and what have you, to take Cuba, to extend slavery. Force is going on. There's a civil war in, in Kansas uh, to take Western territory. And all this to our last image, which you have here, scenes at Uncle Sam's Senate. And I, that was actually a scene from 1850. Right. Of the, working out the compromise. But I wanted to say at last, 1850, we started with, we're going to end with 1850, because 1850 is really 1852. It's 1854. It's 1856. And what is it? There was such distrust. People carried weapons, physical assaults in Congress. Nobody was safe because nobody really trusted each other. The compromise had been a paper over effect that missed the dynam real dynamics of politics that was going on outside of political parties rather than being managed inside by political parties. And that would uh, mind is the importance of the 1852 election is really what it masked rather than what it made. Okay. And the last slide that we have is, the, of course, the Democratic platform. Yes, of 1856, and um, and I think I've gotten ahead of you here, but uh, basically I wanted to include this one because of course this now we've got Buchanan, he's being propped up here, the plan <laughs> Buchanan, and he's being propped up really by facts that he didn't create, facts that are the new political reality in 1856, but also suggesting again that uh, the ultimate fact that Buchanan that made him acceptable and made him available. Uh, he was acceptable because he was pro-Southern, and Southerners completely controlled the Democratic Party by 1856. Uh, and he was available because he wasn't directly involved with the kansas Act. He, he wasn't directly tainted with the Compromise of 1850. He had not been part of that construction, et cetera. So in one sense, he was uh, somewhat attractive uh, to, to Northerners, even though he did not do well uh, in the election in the North in 1856. So uh, that last image reminds us that the 1852 election wasn't over in some ways. It was still being replayed in 1856. Buchanan. Okay. Let me, uh, let me interrupt you here because uh, uh, Tom has uh, let me know that uh, we have several questions and, uh, uh, from our audience. So Let's let's hear what some of those questions are. You can field them. 
Great. Well, thank you, Randall and Patrick, for this animated conversation. Um, we do have a number of questions from folks. I doubt we'll be able to get to them all, and I apologize to those uh, whose questions we may not get to. But uh, Randall uh, Miller has agreed in advance to uh, uh, try and address those even after the fact uh, via email. We've got your, your contacts so we can send stuff off to you. Uh, first question, if we could deal with this briefly, why did um, James Buchanan oppose the gag rule? Well, early on, um, actually, early on, uh, some people did oppose the gag rule who later would accept the gag rule. But, you know, the one thing about Buchanan is, and I, I think we tend to do this, is we tend to see the Buchanan, the early Buchanan, as the same as the late Buchanan uh, in, in terms of the things that he argued for and stood for. Uh, and the other problem with Buchanan is that, and this was one of the reasons why people didn't necessarily want to entrust him with the presidency, is a lot of people didn't trust him. He was a bit of a waffler. Uh, he would take a position and then he would go back in a position. Uh, he couldn't even decide whether he wanted to be accepted of an appointment if offered to the Supreme Court. Oh, uh, yes, and then no, uh, accept an appointment later to the Secretary of State. Oh, yes, and no. And it was the same thing as well in terms of, you know, the gag rule and going on. So as earlier, he, he was, I, I don't want to say he was um, always sniffing the wind to see what was popular. I don't really think that's the case. I think he was just weighing things he was a lawyer, remember, and he was just weighing things and trying to figure out what was the best route. And there was really no gain that early on in doing that. But I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I believe later on, he never said anything against the gag rule mm -hmm. after it went into effect uh, and became basically um, a party rule, if you will. Okay. So now I've got a couple of questions and I'm gonna try and uh, piece them together and make it a one kind of multi-layered question. Um, some have, have uh, said that the 1852 election was kind of the coming apart of the Whig Party. Um, now, against the background of the Underground Railroad, the first biracial mass movement of civil disobedience in the, in the country, we have this fugitive slave law of 1850, uh, where otherwise law-abiding citizens choose to defy the federal laws and risk imprisonment to promote the freedom of enslaved black Americans uh, who were risking their own lives uh, for their freedom. It sounds a lot like Black Lives Mattered at that moment. And I wonder um, what the parallels might be that you would see between that movement and maybe even parallels to uh, this presidential election that we're in the midst of now. Oh, golly. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, and I, I would say a very perceptive one uh, as well. And let me, uh, as a historian, go back before I go forward. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think the perceptive thing about it is that there were willing, there were people by the 1850s, as you pointed out in the, the question you did, who were willing to risk their lives or at least their fortune in one sense to support black people where a few years before they never would have considered it. Uh, but the times they were changing, you know, part of it was cultural. Uh, part of it was that something was being forced on them and they were being forced to choose. Um, part of it was a, a, a kind of a, a political phenomenon that was really a cultural phenomenon uh, that's actually going to find a crescendo by 1860. And that was, you know, many, many Northerners, whatever their feelings were about slavery, and they were not necessarily anti-slavery, but they were becoming increasingly anti-Southern, of, you know, tired of being bullied. Uh, tired of having their own manhood called into question, the game of, you know, of, of braggadocio that Southerners would play, bluff the Southerners would play. And they had done this in terms of, we'll leave the Union unless you give us something. And of course, you gave them something. And uh, th this was a serious cultural concern. It was a, a psychological concern as well that caused people by the 1850s who were not anti-slavery to do things to stand up against the South. Southerners interpreted it as anti-slavery, they didn't draw any distinctions, but it wasn't quite the same thing. It, being anti-Southern was also, one could say, a step toward possibly becoming anti-slavery, which certainly happened during and, and because of the Civil War, if nothing else. 
So uh, you, you've got that context. The issue was being forced on them. You couldn't always run away from it uh, because uh, especially in border states like Pennsylvania, there were instances of it. If you were involved in it, you knew where it had occurred in Christiana, in Philadelphia, or something like that. It was real news and constant news. And there are a couple interesting things about this and those images I showed, I think suggest one of the things, especially Anthony Burns image. Black people were being shown as human beings with their own volition, with their own courage, with their own commitment to their liberty, which would also mean your liberty, would free you from something, which is part of what Black Lives Matter is about. Black, you know, saying Black Lives Matter, people say you shouldn't say all lives matter. Saying Black Lives Matter does mean all lives matter because you're respecting, you're understanding the particular needs of a people that are really our collective needs, a call to all of us to action. And you got something from the, the, the fugitive slave effort that you've gotten today. We got in the civil rights movement as well, the 1960s. And if you're paying attention, you've got it over American history. And that is black people asserting themselves as human beings, right? Human beings with inalienable rights, compelling you to see them in that way. And they did it with their, uh, one of the things that uh, some fugitives would do, of course, it was very popular, is they would write autobiographies. They would write accounts of what it was like to be enslaved and what, uh, and, and what was the meaning of becoming free. Most famous, of course, was Frederick Douglass, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, uh, you know, written by, an Amer by, uh, written by an American slave. And basically, it's the story of a, a slave becoming a man and us seeing it, right? It was in your face, in effect. And that's what they're doing as well. So they're seeking help from many sources, but ultimately they're asserting themselves in freedom. And that's one of the things we saw in the civil rights, but they're, they're creating their own history, forcing us to confront them as people, as courageous people, as honest people, and people that are saying, and what are you gonna do about it? And invoking, and this is the 19th century, invoking the Jesus of Matthew, et cetera. Um, uh, a Jesus of Matthew that says, you know, give me your poor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that that's the analogy we have to today in terms of the numbers of white people who are lining up and supporting Black Lives Matter because they can see the wrong, they can see the courage of people in not only saying this is wrong, but this is, we're going to do something about the wrong and we will risk anything, including our lives in order to realize this. And you need to join it, not to free us, but to free yourself. And that was part of the message of the anti-slavery movements. I think there are real parallels there. Yeah. So not, not to press this point too far, and I've got another question or two to, to move to, but um, I think the Republican Party right now is still a strong party, um, although I think they're searching for a, a sense of identity. And, um, and after next Tuesday, uh, who knows what that search will look like. Um, and so I don't want to draw too close a parallel between the Whig Party coming apart and the challenges the Republican Party face right now. But are there any similarities there, you think, in terms of um, the end of the Whig Party and the challenge that the Republican Party faces today? Whoa. Um, well, the Whig Party really was on its last legs by the late 1840s, late 1850s. They, they had a I'm old enough to say this, so uh, they had a problem of geriatrics. <laughs> you know, worried about the old fogies in the Democratic Party being challenged by the young Americans, et cetera. The, w the Whigs were in deeper, deeper trouble. They they hadn't developed much of a bench. I mean, the kinds of people they had, uh, I mean, well, Seward is, is, is an exception, what have you, but many of the kinds of people they had were past their prime. Yeah. Uh, uh, and in one sense, they're, they're, they, they, were, they couldn't manage their internal differences as well as the Democrats were able to, and the Democrats were having trouble enough. But uh, so, uh, and they, they didn't really have anything new to offer, <laughs> uh, et cetera, mm -hmm. especially in the kinds of issues that were now being thrust forward. The problem with the Republican Party today, though, is similar in so much as, and this is one of the principal questions people, political scientists and others today ask about the Republican Party is, you know, who are they? Mm -hmm. uh, suppose, you know, Trump, and quote, Trumpism has taken over the party by seeming all accounts. Uh, although and you can see there are a lot of people who are beginning to defect 
in the last several months, uh, we already had something of the whole Lincoln project, for example, is an earlier phenomenon it just manifested itself now because there's an election of Republicans who are saying it's not our party anymore. Uh, now, does that mean it's not our party anymore because we are going to stand against Trump and we're just going to let Trump and the Trumpists have the party? Or is it that we're going to, in effect, reclaim the party, knowing that uh, thinking that Trumpism can't survive without Trump? Mm -hmm. The bigger question to answer, to address the question, I can't answer it, is similar to the Whigs in that they have an identity problem, but it's a different identity problem. The identity problem today is dictated by a circumstance in which Trump, Trump is not the cause. Trump is the embodiment of, of something that he was able and people like him to realize, and that there's a tremendous disquiet in the part of large numbers of people who believe that they have been shortchanged, ignored, trampled upon, what have you, by forces greater than they are, uh, and that nobody's paying attention to them. And forces could be the forces of you know, a, a, a global market economy that doesn't include them, whatever it is. So forces where their voices don't count at all, they're, they're, they're mocked rather than respected, et cetera. Uh, so you know, that, that, that's one element in there and don't really have that same kind of thing going with the Whigs um, in, in the 19th century. Their identity problem is really something else. But Trump was able to seize on that and uh, that used to be something that Democrats were often able to do. And a lot of the people who support Trump, this is one of the reasons he won, had been Democrats when, you know, but, but kind of New Deal type Democrats where somebody's paying attention to me. Uh, maybe they're, I'm not getting everything I, I want, but somebody's paying attention to me. I'm at the table, uh, I'm respected. Uh, etc. And uh, Trump, whatever you can say about him, he was able to recognize and seize on it, but he was not the cause of that, that disquiet. And the, uh, he just was able to recognize it and, and seize on it and, and, and succeed from it. How sustainable that is, is, is another question. Remains to be seen. So I'm sure the questioner appreciates your effort to kind of link that uh, 1852 election and at least see if there are any parallels uh, and let, let me interject one thing, though. That I, I also hope I was suggesting that we shouldn't always be looking for analogies and parallels from the past, thinking that somehow they echo today, uh, that uh, every day is its own. In the 19th century, it was a very different political world in most ways than, than 2020. Right. Well, on that note, um, I want to thank you, uh, Randall, so much for uh, this evening and for the many, many ways that you've contributed to the lifeblood of Lancaster history to our efforts to interpret uh, the life and legacy of President James Buchanan. I wanna thank you too, Pat, for your insightful questions and, and helping guide uh, the conversation today. Um, to all of you who have taken the time to spend the evening with us, I wanna thank you. Um, upon exiting uh, the Zoom uh, conversation tonight, a window will pop up uh, and there'll be a post-event survey. We'd love to know your thoughts about this program your ideas for future programming, and we'll be posting a recording of tonight's presentation on our YouTube channel in the upcoming days. So um, please be on the lookout for future programming on our website. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great evening and everybody make sure we get out there and vote. Right. Good night.